average test scores are continuing to rise every year. And that can be a little bit intimidating to people, but that's why I think it's really important to look at the range and remember that we do that holistic review process that Dave referred to, which means we're not looking just at grades and test scores, but when so many highly qualified students are applying, then as you can imagine, that average is gonna be pretty high because there's people applying to the school that have literally perfect test scores and insanely high GPAs, which is really gonna bring up the average. Another trend that we've seen is more people applying early action, and I think that that's something worth addressing because I think a lot of students and families think automatically that if they know they want to apply to a school then they should definitely apply early action <clears throat> to show their interest. And at some schools it might work that way, but it's not always the case. Um, at UMass, I would only recommend applying to early action if you're an academic fit for the school and if UMass Amherst is a match school for you. If it's more of a reach school for you, I always recommend applying regular because it's the less risky option and you actually have a better you know, chance of being admitted in regular decisions. So that's one trend that we've seen that um, I'm not sure what's driving it, but I would like to see it kind of taper off a little bit. The only thing I would add to uh, both those comments um, is first of all technology. Um, you know, five years ago um, it was really vital for students to, to visit colleges, which is in a lot of ways it still is, but the ability for students to take virtual tours now of colleges all over the world, the quality of those virtual, we used to have something on our, at Holy Cross 10 years ago called the virtual tour and it was um, just a bunch of crappy pictures and a couple little videos, but now it's the technology is incredible, and uh, so you have a real students and families have a real ability to see what a what a college campus is like, what any college campus is like really, uh, through virtual tours. So that's been one way. And on the flip side, the technology on our side, the ability to read and track applications and students' information online on our phones. Um, I was uh, stopped to take a call at the rest stop on the way out here today, and looked up a student's application on my phone just so that I could educate myself before the phone call. Obviously, that, uh, we weren't doing that uh, five, six, seven years ago. So the last thing I'd say is I think uh, what has certainly been true, not just uh, here at Holy Cross or Northeastern or UMass, but across the country is student levels of anxiety. Go to, I go to lots of conferences, lots of meetings, and we sit around so often we say, uh, student anxiety can't get any worse. It doesn't get any better. We've only seen an increase of that incrementally each year after each year. And the media certainly contributes to that. Because if you've, well, before the last couple of months, if you, you know, when you read articles, in, if you read, read any article in any national publication that addressed uh, college admissions, it usually addresses one of two things, right? Number one, nobody gets in anymore. Right? The most widely read article about college admissions over the last three years was about Stanford's record low acceptance rate. Everyone wanted to read about how nobody can get into Stanford. Or, uh, national media loves to talk about the second most popular topic when it comes to writing about college admissions, and that's how nobody can afford it. Right? Um, I'm still waiting for that article, though, that would address both of those in the same topic. It would be the feel-good article of college admissions. It would say, you're not going to get in, but don't worry, you couldn't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, I think you all touched on this just a little bit, but could you describe the application review process at your institution? For example, what do you look for on a student transcript and what is important? So at UMass, as I said, we do a holistic review, which means we are looking at your grades and your test scores, and that's really where we start and see if you're an academic fit for the school. And then we look to the other information that you provide us, like your extracurriculars, your essay, your recommendations, to kind of contextualize that information and hopefully it kind of affirms what we're already guessing about you from your academics. But sometimes there, there can be information in the other part of your application that's more personal that helps us understand a little bit more about your grades and scores. So this question asks you know, specifically about the transcript and I think that it's worth pointing out that the transcript at most institutions is gonna be the most important part of your application process, of the application review because the transcript is a record of how you've done over many different years in many different subject disciplines, showing up to school day in and day out, completing your assignments, taking tests, 
um, and it's really going to be the most accurate predictor of student success in college. So not only do we look at the grades that you've earned, but we also look at the rigor of your classes and whether you've challenged yourself in a way that's appropriate to you. We're not comparing you to somebody else. We're looking at you and saying, based on what we're seeing in your transcript and what was available to you at your school, did you take on the challenges that were right for you? So if a student is getting straight A pluses in all their classes and not taking advantage of one of the many AP or honors offered at their school, that's gonna be completely different from a student who's working to their hardest potential at getting Bs, that may be the right place for them. But if a student's coasting through their classes and they have a lot of higher level available to them, we'd like to see them take advantage of that. So again, it's all about that context and looking at you um, as a whole person, not just as a set of statistics on a page. I would completely echo that. Um, so for example, I actually have a cousin that is a high school junior right now that is freaking out just the same and was visiting colleges and wondering about how they talk about GPA. There isn't a week that goes by that I would ask the question, what's your average GPA? And I'll kind of stress every school is different in how they look at high school transcripts. So for Northeastern, we actually recalculate GPA and put everything on a 5.0 scale. You don't have to worry about that. We do that internally, talking about the context of the school and what is available for that. Giving extra weight to honors, AP courses, IB classes, if that's available to a student. If it's not available to them, it's not held against them because it is that holistic context approach. So we essentially can't con compare yourself to a student from another high school because those are different educational opportunities. So within that process, there is that kind of range of looking at if your high school offers higher level courses, typically college are looking to see that combination of rigor and grades. I'm not saying take 12 APs just because you can. You want to see that kind of um, holistic approach of taking classes that students are actually interested in. Um, so that's kind of how the Northeastern process when it comes to the high school transcript. But I'll also echo that shows the most amount of academics that you're looking at. And I think, you know, <clears throat> Jules and Dave hit on important points here. And this is, will be true at any college in the country. The most important thing we do when we evaluate a student's application, in particular the academic credentials, is to understand context, right? To understand the high school you attend, the courses that have been available to you, how you've signed up for those courses. A big part of that, of filling in that information for us is the high school profile. Again, good news to you, it's another document, it's another important part of the application that you do not have to worry about. Your uh, guidance office will send it to us along with your transcript. And that is sort of, uh, it's our decoder ring. It's the information, and it's only interesting to us, it's not interesting to really anyone else in the world, because it's all the answers to the questions that we would have when reading a high school student's transcript. It's all the information that we would want, and we receive one with basically every application that is sent to any of our colleges. So that really helps put the, the transcript, the courses available, the grading in context for us, and it's, uh, it's one of the most important things that we Awesome. Um, moving on, could you talk about the role that test scores play at your institution in their review process? You know, SATs, ACTs, kind of where juniors are at this stage of the process. How much fun does it take the exams multiple times? <laughs> Anyone? No? Okay. Well, there are a lot of colleges that super score. Um, at least at Northeastern, we super score both the SAT and the ACT, looking at the best of each section. Um, I actually don't look at test scores when I'm reviewing. That is something that comes into the, our process a little bit later, which is as someone who was not excited about taking standardized testing in high school. That's one of my favorite things, at least about our process. Um, so when it comes to, we actually don't know how many times you take it either. I just see that end up score. So I talked to a student that was like, is it gonna hurt that I took the SAT four times? And I was like, that's incredibly stressful and expensive, but don't worry, we're just looking at the best of each section, not seeing how many times you took it. But every school can be different. I think probably a common thread that's gonna be throughout this night is it can depend on the college. Um, but there are similar process in kind of looking at super scoring, at least in Northeastern. I'll uh, fly the flag for the test optional schools across this test optional. Your first question to any admissions rep who says that their school is test optional should be, what does that mean? There's lots of colleges flying the test optional flag these days, but it has so many different definitions, actually, in so many different colleges. Um, and Holy Cross, it kind of means the default. It kind of means what you think it means. It means for every student who applies, they make the choice just before they submit their application about whether or not they'd like us to utilize standardized testing in the review of their application. If students uh, said yes, then we'll use standardized testing in our review. Uh, 
in a small way, we used it on our review, in a small enough way that we could certainly do the same review without standardized testing for our students who choose me. For us not to use standardized tests in our review, we don't think they did poorly, we just simply don't think about their scores. Um, I think what you find is that admissions counselors, no matter what college we work at, when we read an application, we think about things that we see. We never think about things that we don't see. And if standardized testing is something that we don't see, we just simply don't think about it. So um, whether or not standardized testing is going to be a strength in your application is a great conversation to have with your guidance counselor, and that may help shape your list early on. But know that even if standardized testing is a strength in your application, there are great test optional schools out there that would be happy to receive your test scores. So at UMass Amherst, we are not test optional. We do require either the SAT or the ACT. And just like Dave was explaining, we do super score either of those tests. So it's totally up to you. And if you take them more than once, we'll look at your best composite score. That's what that means. Um, in terms of uh, a couple other factors to know about testing at UMass Amherst, um, we do not require or look at the writing portion of either of those exams. Um, and we don't require any SAT subject tests for any of our majors. We also consider the GPA and the uh, test scores on a sliding scale, which means the stronger your GPA is, the more flexibility there is on what kind of standardized test scores we'd be looking for. And that is actually um, statewide at any uh, University of Massachusetts school or state college, so, or university. So basically, you know, any state um, public school that you're applying to in Massachusetts has that sliding scale and also looks at your GPA in the same, uh, same way, the way that we recalculate it. So one other quick note is that for in-state students, which you guys are, you have the option of waiving your test scores if you're on an IEP or a 504 plan. So those are the only students who don't have to submit standardized testing at UMass Amherst. Um, teacher recommendations, what would you recommend in terms of who to ask for a teacher recommendation or um, how are they evaluated in the process? So teacher recommendations are part of that holistic review process. So again, hopefully they're confirming what we already think that we, are, we know about you from your application. Um, but they can be really important in talking about some of the qualities that you're going to bring to the institution as a student. So the most important thing that you can do is ask a teacher who knows you well. So it doesn't have to be a teacher in the class that you did the best in, and in fact, possibly it shouldn't because um, the teachers that have seen you struggle a little bit and go through some challenges and overcome some obstacles are the teachers who have really seen those qualities um, as a, of a learner that you exhibit and can talk a little bit about how you overcome challenges and, and what strengths you can bring to the table. Um, and then the other question I often get asked is, should my teacher recommendation be from a teacher in the subject that I want to study in college? And at least from my perspective as a UMass Amherst rep, the answer is no. The most important thing is that the teacher knows you well and can really talk about you personally, not so much what the subject, uh, the subject is. I have some quick advice for the students in the room. I think, I know when I was in high school, I thought the teacher recommendations were just I don't know, that they were like freelance artists, that they just wrote whatever they wanted to write. It's best to think of the teachers who you will ask for your recommendations as chefs, and you get to provide them with the ingredients on the meal that they're going to make. If you want them to write a great recommendation about how thoughtful, and earnest, and hardworking you are, then provide them with those ingredients. Show them all of those qualities. The truth is, these recommendations, they're not these teachers, they're not freelance artists. They are writing these recommendations, these letters, that are built on anecdotes and adjectives that they've witnessed, usually during the second half of junior year. The truth is, every day that you come to school, right now, you are writing that teacher recommendation for your teacher. You are providing that chef with the ingredients. So, you want great teacher recommendations in your application? Bring those ingredients. Give them to the teachers every single day. And once you've asked that teacher for the recommendation, I would say thank you. And I would say thank you in a real way, in a written way, because that first paragraph of your recommendation is likely to mention how thoughtful you are. Great analogy. So um, I always emphasize quality, not quantity, when it comes to recommendations. Um, I have a student that submitted eight teacher recommendations, so don't do that. Uh, but I do think that you're referenced, have those teachers that know you best. 
we're not hunting down to double check if you got a B or a C in the class. Maybe you struggled and they know your work ethic and showcase different qualities that we're not getting from just looking at your transcript. That uh, can be very helpful through that process. Also, I always say, if the teacher asks for a resume, they probably might not know you the best to be able to provide that great recommendation. So think of those teachers that could, without having to have any additional information, know how to write about you. Great. Um, extracurricular activities, things we do outside the classroom, how important would you say those are in the application review process? Extremely important at Northeastern. Um, particularly to Northeastern, it's education model is focused on experiential learning, so extracurriculars, leadership, involvement is something we take very seriously through our process. Um, whether it be one particular passion that you're deep diving into or multiple different opportunities, um, I love when I see students that have part-time jobs. That's a total bias. I'm obsessed when I see a student that's working outside of the office or they have community leadership experience or whatever that might be, let it be known. I believe the Common App has 10 sections in the extracurriculars, so you have room to breathe when it comes to your involvement. Um, and also there are some schools that if you wanted to submit a resume on top of that extracurriculars to showcase more, I know at Northeastern will look at it if a student chooses to submit a resume. So again, the, the extracurriculars are really a part of us getting to know who you truly are as a person and not just what kind of grades you get in the classroom. And I know I keep kind of coming back to this concept of context, but I think it's really important when it comes to talking about extracurriculars. Um, Dave mentioned like part-time jobs. Um, if a student's working a uh, you know, significant amount of hours outside of the classroom, maybe even helping to support themselves or their family, we're not going to then turn around and say, well, why didn't this student also have two captainships or take three APs? You know, It's a context that helps us understand where their time, effort, and energy is going to that can help us understand other parts of the application better. Um, so as any of us would say at any college, it, it again is about that. Uh, quality over quantity, and it doesn't really necessarily matter what exactly you're doing for the most part, as it is that you're doing something that you're passionate about, that you've committed to, and that's meaningful to you. Um, so the same advice that any of us would give is that it's not about filling up your list of extracurriculars with things that you're doing just to stay busy or because they're going to look good on your resume. It's about letting us know who you are and what you care about. So a piece of advice that I always like to share in my information sessions at UMass is to not sell yourself short and that you don't have to limit your extracurriculars to just like formal activities that you do through your school. So we already talked about part-time jobs. But just like your actual hobbies are your extracurriculars too, even if they're not something that you've signed up for that you go to at a specific date and time and pay money to do. If you have a YouTube channel or a blog, if you and your friends like to jam and play music together, if you like to draw graphic novels, write poetry, if you help take care of your younger siblings, that's not really a hobby, but it's still something that you could put on your extracurricular list. So just. Think about your day. What are you doing outside of school that's important to you? And then let us know that. Um, that's what it's really all about. Uh, next, I know I have every junior's favorite topic right now. Uh, what do you guys look for in the essay? Um, are there better or worse topics? You know, any uh, tips you have for that? I think that you can literally write about anything, any topic in the world, as long as you keep it true to you and write about something, again, that's meaningful to you. Um, some of the best essays that I've read have been about like seemingly random subjects, but the way that they uh, worked it really made it uh, stand out. So I'll give a really quick example. Um, one girl wrote an essay about um, red velvet cake and she uh, talked about how when she was younger, her favorite cake was red velvet cake and everyone knew that about her and now people every year for her birthday like constantly make her a red velvet cake or like give her red velvet cake and she doesn't like it anymore but she doesn't tell them that because to her it's more important um, to be grateful for the fact that people remembered that and that they show her that they love her and care about her by giving her what they think is her favorite cake and that that's more important to her than what her favorite cake really is on this day. And so she used an odd little topic of a cake flavor to show what's important to her and her values, to show what's meaningful to her in her life, and 
you know, all those things that we're trying to find out about the essay, which is like, who are you? What, what's important to you? What makes you who you are? So it's not about what you write about, it's about how you connect it to the person that you are and that you're gonna be bringing to the campus. Um, and also, like, just to take a little bit of pressure off of you guys, um, you don't have to have the most original topic in the world. You don't have to make us laugh or cry. Uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, if you, you know, if, like, I remember when I went to sit in on an information session when I first started at UMass Amherst, the person giving it, like, gave the example, some examples of essays that she read a lot, and one of them was, like, being a camp counselor, and I was like, hey, that's what I wrote about. But like, that was really important to me. It was an important part of my life. So uh, we don't care if we read like 10 essays about being a camp counselor, about like tearing your ACL. Like, that's fine. That's what's important to you. That's meaningful and it's true to you. It's all good. And typically the essay is not gonna be the make it or break it factor in your application. It's not like we're gonna say, oh, I was gonna admit this student, but I don't really like their essay topic. Um, and so it's really just, again, more about getting to know you and a chance for you to show us like who you really are and what's important to you. Obviously we want you to edit it, but we're and you know, proofread it and submit a polished final draft, but we're also not sitting there with a red pen grading it. It's not a writing assignment, it's just a supplement to help us learn about you. Couldn't agree more. You know, I think students and sometimes maybe even families spend a lot of time, waste a lot of time, thinking about what they think we in the admissions world want them to write about. And the truth of the matter is we just don't care. Would not care less. We read great essays every year about stupid, stupid topics. And we read horrible essays on what those guidebooks say are great topics right now. We read great essays every year about grandma. We read awful essays every year about grandma, right? There's, there's, it's never been grandma's fault. <laughs> there, there actually is no connection between the topic of the essay and the quality of the essay. There just isn't. The connection is between how you, the student, feel about that topic quality of your essay. You will write the best essay on the topic you want to write about, not the topic you think you should write about. I'll give you an example. So I was visiting a high school not far from here, unnamed high school not far from here, and I was talking with students, and uh, I was finished up, this was in the fall, the student senior year, I was walking out, and this girl grabbed me by the door, and she said, I wanted to ask you about my essay, but I didn't want to do it in front of the group. Okay. She said, well, I have two different rough drafts, I'm just not sure which one I should go for Oh, it's kind of an interesting approach. I've never heard of that before. Why don't you tell me about that? She said, well, my first one, I don't know, it's kind of stupid, but I always thought it would be fun to have a summer job as a waitress. I don't know, my big sister did it. I just kind of thought it would be cool. So this past summer, I got a job at a restaurant, but I didn't have any experience as a waitress, so they wouldn't let me be a waitress. They made me pick up the trash, answer the phone, sweep the floors, do the bathrooms, do all the stuff I didn't want to do. But on my last night of the summer job, they felt bad. So they finally let me serve some customers until I spilled an entire tray of drinks all over it. She said my I've second done that, <laughs> <laughs> she said my second essay was about a community service project. I guess I'll ask you guys, which of those essays do you want to read? The first one. Yeah, I'll ask the parents, which of those essays are you convinced her parents made her send to the Community service. Yeah, of course, because they thought the first one was silly, and it was stupid, and it was making her look bad, and they thought the second one was gonna make her look good. And I'll tell you what I told her at the moment, either would be fine, but hearing you talk about the first essay suggests that you will have fun writing that essay. And if you have fun writing that essay, we'll have fun reading that essay. And you can put your parents' mind at ease. We'll learn about that community service project in your resume, and likely in your interview, and likely in your guidance counselor recommendation. You will always write the best essay on the top of you. <coughs> definitely echo that and I always say in my information sessions the essay is your opportunity to tell something new in the application that is your voice as a 17 or 18 year old showcasing who you are and what you bring to the table whatever that passion may be um, there are certainly topics that we see a lot of students writing about a time and time again because you're also in high school we're not expecting you to change the world uh, immediately right off the bat and if you are definitely write about it um, but I do know that I think that echoing, we can tell when a student is excited about what they're writing about. And we can also tell when they're just cookie cutter thinking about this is what we as an institution want to hear. Every school is also different. 
Um, and talking about supplements, so Northeastern doesn't have a supplement, but I know many schools that do, and I've worked at a previous institution where it was a nice factor to gauge students' interest. Spend time and energy on these supplements. Yes, I know you're applying to many colleges through that process and can be very time intensive, but don't solely focus on the particular college essay because the supplements also can really help showcase your voice and sometimes those are the quirkier questions that really can help you stand out through that process. Um, I know when I worked at Brandeis University that that was something that really helped kind of it was different, it was unique. Like, uh, well, there was one year the question was, there's a ticket in your hand, where are you going? These are the supplemental questions that really can break the mold of a typical college essay and showcase your voice and interest. So spend the time on those supplemental essays wherever you might be applying as well. Awesome. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what the common application is? When should students start worrying about filling out the common app? Not December 31st. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Common App, as many of you probably know, is a single online application that you can submit to many different colleges. A lot of colleges accept the Common App. Some, like UMass Amherst, are Common App exclusive, so that's the only way to apply to the school. And some schools will have like an option where you can either do their own application or the Common App. Typically, from what I've heard from other schools, they don't usually have a preference one over the other if they're offering both, but it's definitely worth asking. Um, so the Common App deadlines are going to be different from school to school. Um, it'll open, you know, usually in like August, um, and you can start working on it right around that time. Um, for, for us at UMass, we have an early action, non-binding deadline of November 5th, and then a regular decision deadline of January 15th. Um, and one misconception that I'd like to correct now is that students think that the earlier they submit their Common App prior to the deadline, the better chance they have of being admitted or that it's gonna show their interest. We're still traveling in the fall, so we're not even reading applications. So even if you are totally on top of your game and submit it October 5th, that's great for you because now you can like relax and, well, relax, um, and check that off your list. I submitted my app to UMass, um, but we're not even gonna start looking at it until after our deadline. That's why we put the deadline where it is. And um, typically, it's not like a first come, first serve situation. We're gonna, I'm gonna start reading, you know, by a, I'm gonna pick a, a school basically and start reading that school. So you don't need to pressure yourself to apply way before a deadline. Just apply by the deadline, and that's great. <laughs> I think that that basically echoes it. Um, there are some other, depending on the schools, Northeastern, we're also on the coalition application, which I know some schools are on, so there can be different ways that you might apply. The Common App tends to be a little bit more common, pun intended, um, but I do know that there is some ease to it, and particularly when it comes to the deadlines, make sure that all the required materials, so you can submit, but there might also be additional things, whether it be coming from your high school um, or other recommendations, always make sure that those are also in by the deadline. I shared this with some students earlier um, who were in my presentation, but it's very important to keep track of all this information in terms of how do you apply to the school, what are the deadlines, do they require a supplemental essay, and something as simple as a Google spreadsheet or an Excel spreadsheet can really go a long way in just keeping track of this so that you don't have to go searching for the information every time on the website or back through your emails or something like that. So um, as We've already noted that there's variations between from school to school how we do things. So um, keeping that information in one place and organized will do you a world of good and just make your life easier. Uh, could you explain the significance of visiting different colleges with regards to either tours, info sessions, interviews, etc.? I think you'll hear the same thing from all of us, which is uh, visiting is such a great idea if that's a possibility for their family. I think the more colleges you visit, the better you get at visiting colleges. And it's a little bit of a skill to be learned. And the more points of comparison you get, I think the instinct early on, especially as you're trying to shape a, a list early in the um, college search process, is to start to figure out what kind of schools you want to visit. I know students are asked a million questions early on, right? Do you want to go to a big school or a small school, or, you know, near or far? And sometimes the instinct is to say, well, if you visit Northeastern and you don't like it, then you don't like big schools. I don't know. Maybe you just didn't like Northeastern that day. Maybe you visit other schools as well. And the only way to really get a sense of what it feels like on these campuses is to try to get your feet on these campuses and, and see them in person. I'll give one little practical piece of advice from visiting colleges, and that's this. And this comes from having seen lots of visitors, especially over April vacation. 
Um, you know, there's always a big group of uh, visitors waiting to talk to our receptionist at the conclusion of our tour. And usually they've got copies of the New York Times and Boston Globe, and they're always waiting to talk to our receptionist about re uh, restaurant recommendations in town. If you've made the effort to visit that college campus, to travel, to see what life is like there, see what student life is like there, read the student newspaper and eat on campus. When you go to locations where food is served to students on a college campus, you get incredible insight into student life. Not necessarily from the food, because the food is great at all these college campuses. But UMass is number one, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had the UMass food, I have to agree with that. <laughs> what you learn is that the UMass representatives always plug some faulty ranking system. <laughs> Reward their own system. <laughs> when you visit uh, locations where food is served to college students, what you see are advertisements for student activities. What you see are students talking to each other. What you see are how students are dressed. You'll see copies of the student newspaper. You'll see flyers for the signups for activities that weekend. You learn so much about student life from just that brief visit to a location that serves food to just those college students. So it's important to work that in to your college visit, to whatever school. I definitely think visiting, if it's available to you as a family, is very key in determining the fit of an institution. I remember when I was on college visits, there was one, and I'm not going to name the school, but I thought it was the dream school for me. I stepped on campus and hated it immediately, um, and ended up visiting another school that later that week and fell in love with it and ended up going there. So I think that there can be helpful context, but also the important thing is what is important to you through this college search? Find those top questions and ask them at all the colleges that you are visiting. Well, I remember when I was looking, I really wanted a Coke school, not a Pepsi school. So that was something I made sure to ask on all the questions. That was something simple, but it was important to me. Ended up with a Coke and Pepsi school. Um, so I think that whether it be the particular financial aid questions that you are know you need to find out from a school when you're visiting, ask that. If you're wondering what type of major is important to you through that process that is a requirement for you to attend that school, ask if they have those opportunities for it. So I think that if you're visiting, don't just visit. Have those in things on, in the back of your mind that you want to get out of that visit um, if you have the opportunity. Awesome. Um, any um, role of interviewing at any of your institutions? We do not have interviews. Yeah, UMass Amherst doesn't offer interviews either. Um, I gave a little bit of advice earlier just um, in terms of um, finding out whether or not schools offer interviews and whether they're option. Most schools that offer interviews, they're typically optional. Um, and that can be a nice way to let them get to know you a little bit better. But also, it's kind of a chance for you to interview them as well and, and really ask some questions like um, that are important to you. And um, show your interest in the school, as I think I already said. but. Uh, some of them will offer interviews like over the phone or on Skype, some are in person on campus, and some schools offer alumni interviews where you might meet with an alumni of the school who lives around here, maybe have coffee together, they might come to your high school, and that would be a chance for them to um, ask you some questions, get to know you a little bit, and share their impressions with the admissions office, as well as a chance for you to ask that alum what their experience was like at the school. So although UMass Amherst doesn't offer them, um, a lot of the smaller schools do, a lot of private schools do, and that could be a nice like supplement to your um, visit experience if you're already going there. Um, and I just want to say I totally echo what Drew said in terms of like um, don't just do the official stuff when you're at campus. You know, yes, you're going to get an information session maybe from us telling you about it, applying to the school, hopefully get a tour with a current student, but then just like hang out there. Like he said, go, go to eat, like go to the library and and get that unbiased view of like what campus is really like from the from the source, which is the students. I'll, I'll just add briefly, if you apply to a school that offers interviews and you don't do the interview, you are a fool. <laughs> I can't use stronger language than that because I'm on the clock, but <laughs> there are two big obstacles that keep students from having interviews. The first, you already heard, every college has different obstacles. Every college has different policy, right? Some schools do them, some schools don't. Some big schools don't do them, but there are many big schools that do do them. And uh, we don't have any sympathy for you on, on that obstacle. Zero sympathy, because every school that does interviews goes to great lengths to communicate their policy to you. They will certainly email it to you if you're on their mailing list. And in 30 seconds or less, you can figure out their policy if you visit their admissions website. 
that removes that obstacle, which leaves just one remaining obstacle to having an interview when you apply to college, and that's urban legend. Right? It's the trick questions you think you might be asked. It's what you find if you type into Google college admissions interview questions. It's a whole bunch of questions posted on the internet just to freak out. <laughs> None of them are real, right? If you were a tree, what would you be? If you were a fruit and vegetable, what would you be? You are not asked any questions to which you don't already know the answer because the questions are about you. And not just about you, because I guess the tree question's about you. Mm -hmm. The questions are about the things you talk about every single day. Your friends and your family, your high school and your hometown, your clubs and your classes, your hopes for college, your dreams for college, your questions about college. It is literally the dialogue you're already having every single day. And if you can have that dialogue with an admissions representative without swearing, it will help you get into college. <laughs> I, I, do, so I do these workshops with 8th graders. When you mention to an 8th grader college admissions interview, their brain explodes. They can't imagine anything more difficult. And I'm on the other side, I'm like, I can't imagine anything easier. If you just like get to have a conversation about you, and if you just don't swear, it helps you get into college, the bar is set incredibly low for success. And they're really, once you remove that obstacle, these trick questions, there's no obstacle to having an opportunity. It's an incredible opportunity for you to develop your voice, but most importantly, to control the things you control and demonstrate your interest to those particular uh, Let's talk about applying early as an increasing trend every year. Could you all talk about the role of early decision and or early action in your application process? Early decision is certainly not for the faint of heart. It is not a solo decision either. You are working with your family as well as talking to your counselor to determine whether an early decision is the right fit for you to apply. If you know an institution is your top choice, it is extremely advantageous to apply early decision if that is available at that school. That is the biggest way to showcase demonstrated interest. We know you're applying to other colleges, but if you apply early decision, we know if we admit you, Yes, you are required to attend, but also then you probably already have the sweatshirt, you're not stressing about it the rest of your senior year, you withdraw all your applications while the rest of your friends are stressing. And I think that when colleges have early decisions, they are much smaller pools when it comes to the applicants. So yes, there is a little bit more time and attention knowing that it is a student's top choice. Also, I would probably say most institutions offering a decision, the acceptance rate is a little bit nicer to that. They're certainly looking for academically and fit students for that institution, but it is a little bit of a leg up, I would say so. And I know at Northeastern, when we have over 62,000 applications, our early decision one and early decision two pool was only about 3,000 students in total. So yes, there is some advantages to when it comes to that process, when it comes to it. Um, but I think that when it comes to early action versus regular, that can depend on the school. At least at Northeastern, it is essentially the same process. You just find out your decision a little bit earlier on or a little bit later on. If you want to showcase more of your senior year, applying regular is the best opportunity for you to do that. Typically, you'll have more than one academic semester if that's available for grades. Maybe you're doing some of your best work in your senior year. If you apply regular and kind of wait in that process, there's usually more to look at. Also, isn't it so fun to take SAT, like I said? Yes, applying regular gives you more time to take another standardized test if that is something that is an important factor that you want in that process. So I always say, if you feel that the institution is the best personal, financial, and academic fit for you, and I will stress financial fit as well, applying early decision is something that I highly recommend. So UMass Amherst doesn't offer early decision. We just have the early action, which is non-binding, and the regular decision. And I already alluded to this earlier that I don't necessarily recommend like a blanket um, advice of applying early. In fact, the opposite. It's really something that you want to discuss with your college counselor who can give you some advice that's particular to you based on how well they know you and your academics and everything like that. Um, let me explain a little bit why I don't recommend early action necessarily, um, especially if you're more of like a borderline um, academics fit for you, Matt Samers. That's because um, in early action, there are three things that can happen. You can be denied right away from the school, unfortunately. Um, you could be accepted, which is great, or you could be deferred, which some people, which what you would think is, oh, now I'm a regular decision applicant and, applicant and I get another chance, yay. But in reality, a deferred student is like our third pool um, of admissions at UMass Amherst. So you don't go back into the regular decision pool. You get looked at after regular decision and at 
what happened this year, at least at UMass, is that we were pretty much full by the time we finished with regular decision. And our boss said, we're sending all our deferred students to the wait list. And I was like, oh my God, like there are students on there that I would have just accepted if I knew that was gonna happen and all this stuff. Admissions is a moving target every year. It's always a new challenge for us to figure out, you know, how many students are gonna apply. It's, it's like gonna be a surprise. How many students are gonna apply to this major versus that major? So we, you, we, it's really hard to predict what's gonna happen. And so that's why I say applying early action can be more of a risk because getting deferred is not necessarily like the place that you want to be. That's my personal experience from actually sitting on the other side of the desk watching these decisions go out. So for students that you like, you, you look at the profile, you say, yeah, that totally, I'm above the average and all this stuff and I'm applying to an open major, great, go for it, apply early action, find out earlier that you got accepted and you know, get your sweatshirt and chill out. Um, but for the students that are more of a risk or you're thinking, oh, this is going to be a bit of a stretch for me, get your senior year grades in, put your best foot forward at regular decision, which is the standard time to apply. So that's just like something that I've really been trying to get the word out this year um, because I want students to want to be at UMass to have the best chance of getting accepted to the university. So you could get it completely different advice from another school. So that's why it's important to build connections and have conversations with the schools that you're really interested in and find out, um, and find out how that school does things. As if it wasn't complicated enough deciding which of the 4,000 colleges in the U.S. you should apply to, then you have to decide which application to submit to those schools. I think when you think about what schools to apply to, you ask everybody, right? Neighbors, recommendations, cousins, uncles, aunts, friends, anybody who will give you recommendations about where to apply. But when it comes down to which application are you going to submit to each individual college, your guidance counselor is always the point person, right? They have an understanding of your academic record and your family's circumstances. They know the history of applicants from New North. They also have connections at the, all these colleges. They're the only person who can touch all those three parties. So when you make the decision about which application to submit to individual colleges, you need to be in close consultation with your counselor and any contact you might have at that particular college. So the next question, one I get quite frequently from juniors at this point, what should I be doing in the next couple of months as we come into summer before senior year? I'd love to start with this one because I always tell students that the most important thing that they can do is to study and focus on school because we already talked about how for all of us, the transcript is the most important part of your application process. That's your grades, especially your junior year grades because those are gonna be the ones that you've completed for sure by the time you start applying to colleges, depending on what when your marking period comes out, when you apply, we may not see your senior year grade. So like, this is it. So in my opinion, the absolute number one best and most important thing that you can do is to work hard in school, to make connections with your teachers, to do well on your exams, and really just focus on your job, which is being a student. The secondary part is doing your research and starting to figure out you know, your college list, what kind of colleges you want to apply to, starting to you know, take some of those standardized tests and um, you know, visit colleges. But that should, in my opinion, come second to your priority, which is the classes that you're in right now and doing well in them. I'll pretend like that question was from parents, Perfect. which I'm mm -hmm. doing now. Um, there's this uh, educational philosophy called understanding by design. Anyone who's gone to grad school in education would have probably had to learn that. It's about books about this thing, and I can't summarize it that well. But I would, one of the central tenets implores classroom teachers not to think about what you want to teach in the first day of class, but think about what you want your students to know on the last day of class, and then to write your syllabus back. I always advise parents to take that idea, take that methodology, and use it with the college search and application process for your children. Don't think about how to start the search process for your children. Think about, um, what would it be, like August 28, 2020? That, that would be like move-in day for your children, their college campuses. And don't think about where you want to be moving them into, right? Don't think about the college that you'll be driving to in your station wagon if those still exist. Think about the person you'll be dropping off at college that day. Think about the qualities you want them to have to be successful as a college student and really as an adult. And not, don't just think about it. I think this is an active exercise. I think you should enumerate those qualities. Make a list, three or four or five qualities you 
want your son or daughter to have at that moment, at the end of this timeline, at the end of this process? Because if you take the time now to identify those qualities, I promise you, you will recognize the opportunities to, to foster those qualities and to support and encourage those qualities throughout the next 18 months, particularly as you're looking for, visiting, and applying to college. I did this for my daughter. The list was short. I said I wanted her to have a well-developed sense of voice. I wanted her to have an appreciation for the value of money. I wanted her to have the ability to give thanks. And I wanted her to have a, a, a clear sense of, of who she might be, not of who she is now. Uh, I wrote those down. I, she's only three. I hung them right over her crib. <laughs> <laughs> she, she can't read them, but we've set the stage early. I don't know how to follow that. That's great. <laughs> I think that it is an individual situation based on what the main priorities that you're thinking about. Um, I definitely would stress what Jewel said when it comes to focusing on school because junior year is very important in the college process. Also during this time, if you haven't already, you're thinking about what courses you want to take in your senior year. I think that that is also important that if you have the opportunity, if you think you can handle more academic rigor if it's available, push yourself to take those opportunities to um, extend upon that. Think of the classes that you think would work well for what potential major that you're looking to take when you're going to a college. If you're undecided, that's okay. Start the conversations for what is important to you in the college process. And also, get to know your guidance counselor. They are your advocates through this process that can tell you what, where, based on what stage you're at in the college process right now, leading into it to set you up for success as you lead into your senior. Also, enjoy your summer. <laughs> Sounds simple. Try it. Um, next, a very important topic I want to touch on, financial aid. Um, so what would you give advice in terms of general financial aid advice, thinking about it right now? Nothing too in-depth, but at this stage. I'll just say real briefly, because this is probably happening in all of our offices right now, lots of calls at the financial aid office from admitted students. Um, in general, financial aid officers and people who are working in the financial aid process love to handle questions early in the timeline rather than problems at the end of the timeline. And so often, I think um, families are afraid to ask about finances. They're afraid to have that conversation internally about what the family can afford and what the family is willing to afford. So as you research colleges, as you research academic programs, residential life, and admissions policies, it's a good idea for the, for the family, in particular the parents, to be researching financial aid policies as well early in the process ask those questions early on as well, so that when your son or daughter goes to submit their applications for admission, they'll be strongly in the know about the financial aid policies at those particular colleges, and whether or not they'll be a good fit for them. So, one part of that question is, you know, about filling out the FAFSA, when should you do that? I'd say as early as possible. The um, financial aid, um, the, the FAFSA is the federal application, the Free application for federal student aid, right? Something like that. <laughs> so um, just like to put that out there, that that's you know, the form that you're going to fill out that's going to make a, uh, an offer to you on different kinds of need-based financial aid based on your family's income and their assets. So that can be many different types of aid, from loans to grants to work study. Um, and it can also be supplemented with private loans um, and scholarships as well. So it's just a starting point, but I truly recommend that everybody that is gonna need financial aid um, or wants to take advantage of financial aid, fill out the FAFSA. Whether or not you think um, you're gonna be eligible for it or not, it's definitely worth filling it out. As it says in the name that I butchered, it is free. So it's a free application for federal student aid. That's what it is. Um, and so you might as well fill that out and like the earlier that you fill it out, uh, the better, to be honest. Um, and then just like, Drew was saying, you know, keep in touch with the financial aid officers. In admission, we try to know, obviously, a, a fair amount about our financial aid policies because that's an important part of um, making that decision and applying to schools, but the financial aid officers are the ones who can answer all those little detailed questions um, that you may need answered. So they're a really terrific resource to take advantage of as well. And then just remember that the package that you start with as an incoming freshman doesn't have to be static. It doesn't have to stay the same all four years because there are a lot of private organizations that offer scholarships to students based on their performance in college. 
So these are scholarships that you can't apply for until you've already gotten some college grades under your belt, but that, those can be terrific ways to supplement what you already are getting in need-based aid or merit scholarships from the school. So your financial aid search doesn't have to stop the moment that you walk through those doors. It can continue and can and should continue as you find other ways to help bring down that, that overall cost. I think it's also important to think about the financial aid deadlines can also vary depending on institutions. So um, to the parents that are stressing their son or daughter or students that they need to get their applications in on time, to the students remind them there's also some deadlines on the other end as well. Um, I do think that as long as those deadlines are met, at least in Northeastern, you receive your financial aid package with your admissions decision. So we always want to put our best foot forward on all the information at once so that you're not waiting to find out if it's a financial feasible fit later on in the process, which can be the case at some schools. Um, so certainly start to, to consider those deadlines or whether a school requires a CSS profile as well as the FAFSA. Um, I'm not a financial aid counselor and we, that is in our realm. So get to know those financial aid counselors. And a lot of institutions, you can actually find out who your particular counselor is, whether it be based on alphabet split or based on regions. So similar to admissions counselors, you can actually find out who your financial aid counselor is and reach out and start those conversations earlier on. Great, and um, any advice for students applying who may be on an IEP or a 504 plan and the role that will play in their application process? So as I mentioned, um, at the state universities and colleges, that does give you the option of waiving your standardized test scores. It's totally fine if you still want to submit them. That's fabulous, but if you don't want to, then you do have that option. The most common question I get asked about this is, um, is, this going, I, is this going to impact my admission, my admissibility to the school in a negative way? And the answer is absolutely not. The more information that we have about you, the better a decision that we can make. And having an IEP or a 504 or just a learning difference, um, even something as simple as like having test anxiety, these are things that can really uh, um, impact how we understand your application. So a student on an IEP or 504, it's not gonna work against them to let us know that, it's gonna work for them because it helps provide that accurate context for us to understand the work that they've been doing in the classroom. So never be afraid to disclose that information. Um, the school will let us know if you, they can confirm that you're on an IEP or 504, at least at UMass Amherst. You don't have to submit all your testing, you just need to let us know, you know, a confirmation that you do have that. And then one thing you should do post admissions at the school that you're planning to enroll in or schools that you're choosing between is to reach out uh, again to find out what kind of um, like resources and supports are going to be offered to you on that campus to help you know continue to make you be to help you be successful in the classroom. Fantastic. So now I'd like to offer the opportunity if anyone in the audience has additional questions for our panelists. Now you can just raise your hand right over here. To repeat the question for those in the back, the question was, is there any negative impact at a test optional institution of not get, being eligible for merit scholarship money if you choose not to submit your test scores? Uh, it really depends. It's possible, though. So it's a good question to ask uh, of each individual test optional school that your son or daughter might be applying to, because it's possible that their highest merit rewards might be tied to standardized testing. So it's a good question to ask of each school. Any other questions we have? Okay. Is there any effect on the acceptance process having one versus multiple applicants in the same high school? Uh, the question, if you didn't hear, was is there a difference on admissibility if there are more applicants from the same high school? I think in general the answer is no. Um, and if anyone has different, please feel free to share, but I've never heard of a school, um, a college that has like a quota for a high school or something like that. At UMass Amherst, we certainly don't. Again, we're not really comparing you to other people. We're just looking at your application. Are you a fit for UMass Amherst? If you are, we're going to accept you, regardless of you know how many other students from your school are also a fit for UMass Amherst. So we don't have a quota. It doesn't work against you if you go to a large high school where a lot of students apply to a certain well, to UMass Amherst in my case, um, that really doesn't 
play a factor at all, which is great news and can put people at ease a little bit. So I actually checked the numbers before I got here on how many applications from this high school Northeastern got. I had 130 that I read from this high school. Um, so, but I would agree, there is not a quota. It changes each year depending on what students are applying, the, what their interests are, the overall holistic approach that we're talking about. Um, but I will say that it is important to know that based on the context, it, schools are looking at what is available. So a lot of colleges will read based on school group. So we can get a sense of what that bell curve or range of opportunities and availabilities or whether a student with three APs is the most amount they can take at a high school or three is really not as successful compared to the 50 other that we read that day. Um, so I do think that some context clues can be helpful in those groups, but I don't think there's a situation where it's like we're comparing one student next to each other because they went to the same high school. Right in the back. Uh, the question was, if you apply early decision, the binding option, will you receive your financial aid package when you get your acceptance letter? At Northeastern, yes. And if there is something that's missing within the financial aid package, it is a detailed response from the Student Financial Services Office on what they need and their contact information to make sure that that is available. Um, and similarly, merit scholarships also is a process, at least at Northeastern, you'd find that out immediately. I know that early decision is a big thing when it comes to finances because you are admitted, you are required to attend. In my experience throughout my time, um, I have not heard of a student that applied early decision needing to break that contract because of finances. It can happen, but it hasn't happened in my experience. Right in the middle here, Brian. What opportunities are for first generation students? The question was, uh, what opportunities at your school are there for first generation college students? So at UMass Amherst, we have this wonderful um, interdisciplinary um, group called the student. It's called Student Success, and that is a way for students to connect with um, student success mentors that are faculty or staff on campus that were also first generation to college students. Um, a lot of first generation students have, you know co-occurring identities, you know, a lot of first generation students may also be students of color, for example, and so there's a lot of other um, supports, you know, through things like our Center for Multicultural Advancement and Student Success that some first generation students may also want to take advantage of, so it's not just about you're first gen, you're a student of color, you're from Newton. You know, it's about kind of finding ways to support you in all the different identities that you hold, and for one, one of those maybe first generation to college, then I would suggest you know, specifically looking into that student success coalition. There's, great, there's incredible resources at colleges now, and a big part of that has just come from applications being elect electronic now. And we're now able to simply download students' uh, family history with college and whether or not a student is first generation or not. Um, I date back to reading applications where we used to have to circle it on the application and fill out a form and somebody would have to do data entry on that, whereas now it's just a, a single click and we're able to know how many students are in the class are first generation and what that is at college. So that's um, allowed colleges to utilize that information and data and provide uh, a significant increase in programming. And a simple little search on any college's website for first generation is gonna probably lead you to an entire website if not booklet and list of programming available to students that is specifically directed at first generation college students. So at Northeastern we have 18 cultural and identity centers. Uh, so I know when it comes to the vast amount of resources, as mentioned, it can be more than one identity, whether it be first generation or otherwise. Um, but I do know that we have similar programs to TRIO, which I know some students when it comes to tutoring services or academic advising, um, those resources are known very early on when students come to campus through our orientation. Um, so we make sure that if a student is first generation, they're not lost through the cracks of wondering what they need to do to succeed because we're making sure all those resources are provided throughout the entire orientation week. Uh, 
the question was about declaring a major and how important is it for a student to do that ahead of time when they apply versus when they actually get on campus? That's a great question and you know I hate to say it again but it depends on the school, right? Um, and that's why asking these questions and doing your research is so important. Um, I think you know, we all understand and support students in their exploration of different areas of study and, um, you know, possibly changing majors when they, for example, you know, I told someone that's maybe still in the crowd a bit long and um, twisted tale of how I ended up coming to my major that I ended up with at UMass um, that involved multiple changes and combinations, then one change and the other one stayed the same anyway. Um, I didn't end up like finding out what I wanted to major in until I took a class in it. Exactly what you said, it's communication. And um, I was like, wow, oh my gosh, this is it. Like, this is fascinating to me and I, I want to major in this. But I would never have known that if because I hadn't been exposed to that field of study yet. Um, so that's really normal. So all colleges are going to support students in their exploration and wanting to change their minds, which is a normal thing. About 75% of college students will change their major at one point in their college career. But I think the important thing to think about is how does it impact you right now as, in, as coming into um, college and through the admissions process because that's where it can really vary. Um, of course, it's important to think ahead, but also, like, for example, at UMass Amherst, you do have to choose a major or at least one of our 10 schools and colleges. That doesn't mean that you're gonna be limited to that major, that now you're officially in that major and that is your career. Um, but because there's so many support systems for students changing their mind or doing you know, all different kinds of combinations and stuff like that. But it plays an important role in our admissions process because there are certain programs at our university that are more competitive or they have a lot of interest and not as much room, which means that they're more selective and more difficult to get into. So that's something you wanna be aware of when you're applying because the major that you choose is going to have an actual impact on the, li on the likelihood or the admissibility of being accepted. So just for reference, the programs at UMass that are considered competitive are nursing, engineering, business, and computer science. So any majors within those schools or colleges are gonna be more difficult to get into. So that's something that students have to be aware of when they apply. And then they would want to choose a backup major for their second choice major on our application that's not a competitive program. So that if they're admissible to UMass Amherst, but not to that competitive program, then we can at least give them a yes. And then they could go ahead and explore what are my options for transferring into that major, or do I even want to come to this school if I didn't get into my first choice major, but at least then they have that option. But that could be completely different from another school. You know, I mean, obviously, Drew and Dave will speak on their own institutions, but like I did a presentation last spring with the uh, rep from the University of Florida, and they don't even look at the major. Like, you're either accepted or you're not, and then basically they let, like, the college like sort you into your majors later. It's more of like a post admittance thing, whereas it plays a pretty significant impact into our admissions process. So it can really vary. So I think there's a couple uh, important points when it comes to choosing and selecting a major, and it can absolutely depend on an institution. Um, one of them is you might be applying to a particular college if you're deciding on a major, which also could include certain things like, for example, subject tests. Um, at least in Northeastern, we have 175 different majors, but we're one university. So while we have eight colleges within that, the admissions process does not change depending on what a student applies. And about 15% of students come in undecided to Northeastern. We also, I, research shows college students will change their major. I worked with a student who changed his major eight times between being admitted and orientation. And eight times been convincing him to work with their undecided advisors. So I hope you're not like Nathan. Uh, but I, that is the ease, at least in an institution that is a little bit larger, where it is so accessible to combine your major, change your major, work with advisors through that process. But I think when it comes to the admissions process, it can vary depending on the school and what they're looking for through that process. Uh, because how easy it is to change that academic flexibility in Northeastern, we actually don't require separate tests and won't even look at them if a student submits them. Um, so don't spend the money to send to us. Um, so I think that that is an important factor for us our process when we're looking at the type of classes a student's taking. Um, so while there isn't a different admissions process, say a student's interested in applying as an engineering major. If they're not taking pre-calculus, chemistry, and physics, they might not be the most successful student within that major. So we are looking at the types of classes a student's taking if they're selecting the major, but it isn't like a set kind of core curriculum required, at least not in Eastern. I'll just say something to the students. You're 
parents and counselor are asking you a lot of questions about what you want to study in college right now. They're not doing it to put pressure upon you. They're doing it because there's 4,000 colleges in the U.S. and they're trying to, to narrow down that list a little bit based on your interests and perhaps strengths. Know this, though. If the authentic answer to that question is, I don't know, then just say, I don't know. We talk to so many students who I think fill in an answer to that question about what they want to study in college because they think they're supposed to have the answer, because maybe their friends have the answer, or maybe their parents think they're supposed to have the answer. It's okay if you do know the answer about what you want to study in college. But if you don't know what you want to study in college, you should answer that question with, I don't know. But here's the, here's the, um, here's the stipulation. You cannot put a period at the end of I don't know. I'm giving you the green light to say I don't know. But you have to put a comma at the end of I don't know. And after the comma, you have to talk about things that you do know about your academic interests. Because what your parents and your counselor are trying to do is help. They're trying to help connect you with colleges that could potentially be the right fit for you. So if you have no idea what you want to study in college, that's okay. Say, I don't know, comma, but I'm really enjoying my blank class right now. That's the start of a good conversation, and you are providing information to help your counselor and your parents connect you with the right kind of Any other questions? Right over here up front. question for those who may not have heard is how are students evaluated if they are in you know, honors and AP level classes getting a B versus getting an A in a lower level class? Well, all colleges are going to take that in context of the class that it's, um, that they're, the level of the class that they got the grade in. Some colleges like um, UMass Amherst, and I know from what Dave said earlier, Northeastern are going to actually uh, weight and recalculate the GPA. So like at UMass Amherst and all the other um, state schools and colleges, so this is another thing that we all do the same, is weighting and recalculating. So we take the core classes and then we add weight for any honors, AP, IV, or dual enrollment level classes. So the example you gave, a B in an AP class would actually be, be considered as an A on our, on, in, a, in our weighting scale because we add a full point for an AP class to the GPA, which is a full letter grade and half a point for an honors level class. So we're actually literally giving them you know, credit for having taken those classes at the higher level. Even a school who doesn't do a weighting or recalculating is still going to look at that in context and understand um, that the GPA may be a little bit lower because they chose to take on rigorous classes, which is a good thing. So a few students actually the same exact scale for a point and half point when it comes to honors versus AP, IB, dual enrollment. Um, but I think it's a combination of the two. I, all, I never want a student to overexert themselves based on if they can only handle a few APs, that's all they can handle based on their academic rigor. So it's the success of grades of that course that excites them, that they're interested in, but also pushing themselves if it's available. And I certainly know within the school, you have the opportunity to push yourself through that, the classes that you're taking. Any other questions in the back here? Uh, question was, is there a difference in how students are evaluated if they're coming from a vocational high school versus a more traditional high school? So one thing where that would come into play for UMass Amherst and for the other state public institutions is that some of those, um, and in fact many of those vocational classes may not count towards their recalculated GPA since we only take um, core academic classes, but we're still gonna take into consideration all the hard work that they put into their program. So if a student, for example, is going to a vocational high school and focusing on cosmetology or um, culinary, then those classes may not count towards their recalculated GPA and only their academic classes would, which sometimes means that you know students whose strengths is whose strengths are in more of those hands-on fields, it might not be so well reflected in their GPA, unfortunately, um, but that's why we don't just look at their GPA and transcript and we do a holistic review so that we can say, you know, well, this student may not have that GPA that we're typically looking for, but they've really excelled in their vocational classes and they're coming in 
um, into a field that's related so you know we can really like have that context again. So I can give you like a quick example. As you guys may know, UMass Amherst has a really strong agricultural school, the Stockbridge School of Agriculture. I admitted a student um, early earlier this year, early action, who was below what we would normally look for academically, but he was so passionate about agriculture. He had his own like agricultural business and uh, you know, which just like clearly was going to excel in the field that he was applying to. So it was about that context and not just looking and saying, oh yeah, that GPA isn't what we're looking for, you know, just pass it along. So students for us that go to vocational high school, we are gonna rely especially on that holistic review process. Some of the vocational classes may, may count. It really depends on whether it's something that we teach at, at our institution. question was, what is the college perspective of using Naviance? So Naviance is just a way for the college counselors to submit the materials to us and keep track of all the information. So we don't like see Naviance or anything. We, it doesn't really affect us, except for the fact that we know what an important tool it is. Um, and also a great way for um, schools to share information with their students, to keep track of different things, to show them like those scattergrams so that they can help with our college search process. So we like fully support Naviance, but it doesn't like directly um, impact uh, our work because it's on the, the other end of the software that we're using. The software that they're using and the software we're using connect, but we don't really use Naviance. Um, but I can tell you like from a not UMass standpoint, I'm also on the, um, on a, I'm a board member on a group called the Hatfield Education Foundation, which is like a nonprofit in my hometown. And we received a grant application from the high school that was to help them get Naviance. And I was like, oh my gosh, they don't have Naviance? Like, we have to get them this grant. Like, this is so important, like, just from what I know of working with college counselors. So um, I think Naviance, from what I've seen on my end, is an extremely useful and important tool um, that really benefits the school for sure. Probably a little bit of a devil's advocate <laughs> when it comes to Naviance. Um, I think in conversations that I've had with many parents as well as students, they think of Naviance as well as any scattergram as kind of an exact science of whether or not their student would get into the institution. Every college admission cycle changes for every institution. So it cannot be an exact science based on certain GPA or certain test scores that it, there is any guarantee that you will get into it. Um, so I think sometimes I have some of my most difficult conversations with people based on, well, in the audience, it might, they were, they're gonna get in based on what happened in the past and this year might have been different. So I think that it is a helpful tool, but not an exact science when it comes to Naviance, as well as other things like College Confidential and other information that you might find out. Um, so I think that take it with a grain of salt when it comes to some of those um, outside resources. I think that sometimes they could be helpful in your guidance office more so. Right here. I've got a question on, on geography. Ironic you chose that because we don't have students in 49 states minus North Dakota. Um, so, but to be honest, there, there is, like I said earlier, there isn't a scenario where it's harder for a student to get in if more students are applying for that. We're looking to see whether or not they'd be successful for that. But yes, geographical diversity is very important for a lot of schools. Particularly for us, international is something that we take very seriously. 20% of students at Northeastern are international. So we have counselors um, that recruit in areas. We have counselors that recruit all throughout um, the United States, but also internationally in that important aspect. Um, so I will speak for Northeastern. We're not one of those Boston schools where everyone's from New England, just frankly. We didn't, in the past, we were that commuter school where everyone's from Boston, but that's not the Northeastern of today. So we want to value diversity in different capacities, whether it be through socioeconomic status, um, major interests, diversity of thought, diversity of ethnic breakdown. Um, so geographical diversity is something that we do consider, um, but it's not a, a 
We're not going to admit every single student from North Dakota just because we're missing them. We want to know that they are still successful at Northeastern. So fortunately at UMass Amherst, it tends to kind of shake out where we do have more applicants from Massachusetts, but we also want to have the majority of our students be in-state. We're around 70% in-state, 30% out-of-state, but that's not something that we um, need to factor in beyond the normal holistic review where we're making decisions, where our supervisors are saying, you know, these are the standards for in-state, these are the standards for out-of-state, or you need to admit this number of in-state students, this number of out-of-state out students. Um, fortunately, just our applicant pool and the way it, it, it just works out, um, but it's also possibly a bit above our level, and it's more in that enrollment management where they're really kind of making those decisions. Um, and then we kind of, our work hopefully supports their institutional goals that they're looking for. Worth recognizing too, I think sometimes we get accused of discriminating against local students. I meet a lot of students in February and March of their junior year who say, I'm definitely applying to Wake Forest, and to North Carolina, and to Duke, and any school that does not receive 12 feet of snow throughout the winter. <laughs> so there are just as many New England students who want to get out of New England and flee to the southern schools as there are colleges looking for students from outside of the area. We have time for a couple more questions. If we have anything else. All right, well I guess that wraps about up tonight about all the Thank time you all. we have. Thank you all. Thank you everyone for coming. Have a wonderful night.